whether you play guitar professionally or for pleasure, it's not going to be very much fun if you're playing hurt. So we're here to explain how guitarists can get into trouble and how they can stay out of trouble is Dr. Markison, our chief medical expert. He's a hand surgeon in San Francisco, and he's also a musician himself, and he plays professionally. So welcome back to the show, Dr. Markison. We're so happy to have you. Tell us. Thanks, um, Thanks very much. Yeah. So what are um, the ways that guitarists get into trouble? I know that they have trouble with various problems. It could be thumb pain or elbow pain or shoulder issues, and it's different for each hand. So how shall we begin? Right. Background on my part is 40 plus years of seeing people do things well and properly and not so well and not so properly. And so it's, uh, it's easy to get in trouble and it's harder to get out of trouble. So it all starts with posture and the basic theme that ergonomics involves bringing the object to you rather than leaning into and twisting around it. Trouble starts when you pitch your head forward. If you're looking down at the fretboard, then you're not using your ears. If you use your ears more, you won't be looking at the fretboard. And arguably, if a great pianist is playing, he or she is not looking at the keyboard. They can close their eyes and kinesthetically know exactly where they are or sight read on the page, never looking at the keyboard. There's really no reason to look at any musical instrument that you're playing if you can avoid it. And so let's start with posture and then go to playing instrument mechanics. One, sit up straight. Again, thematically, your head's a bowling ball is an unstable strut called the neck. If you're pitching three inches forward in a facial plane, then you're gonna triple the forces through the base of the neck and get the ball rolling for neck strain. But that's not where it ends because you've got all of these wonderful nerves coming out of the spinal cord which go under the collarbone and branch ramify to become peripheral nerves. Famously, the median nerve, the carpal tunnel nerve, the ulnar nerve for little and ring finger, the radial nerve that supplies this region. And so you neither want sensory problems, numbness, tingling, or motor problems, movement, weakness. So sitting up straight is going to relax neck, thorax muscles, get you an ideal position and nobody has shoulders at the same height. Just let them fall. Don't find yourself in difficult musical straits, cranking up on the trapezius or superior inferior rhomboids, suspensory muscles of scapula and shoulder girdles. So then you're, you're ready to pick up an instrument. And I'll just show by way of a little baby that was born during this shutdown of the coronavirus, because I like to make my own instruments so that I can have some ease and comfort. Wow. Well, making your own instrument would certainly make it fit, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, of course. I mean, you aren't going to, your shoes may actually be different sizes and your sleeves may be different lengths and so on. And so nobody guaranteed human symmetry and or um, same size. So the tenets of industrial design are choice and adjustability. So here's a sweet little baby Telecaster. I guess my own little innovations. And, it, and it's based on a kit from Stumac, S-T-E-W-M-A-C.com. They're fabulous. And they sell these little baby Telecaster kits, baby this, baby that, recently a baby, well, all kinds of babies, okay? Suffice to say that you can make something, in this case, I'm up a musical fourth, meaning five frets, but it's otherwise tuned in the intervals of fourths plus the third as usual. But you'll note that I've, I've contoured it somewhat so it'll fit my body. So oh. I do recommend to every guitarist that he or she try making a, a guitar. The kits are dirt cheap. It's a weekend's work, maybe a little more to put a finish on it. But you'll note that, that what I've done here is I've just let it hang. I'm sitting, I'm standing, sitting up straight. I, I really don't want to go like this. The last thing I want to do is stretch muscles. Yeah or shorten muscles because there's a curve that tells us an ideal range of fiber lengths wherein your muscles work best. best the Blix curve. We have, an, we have a whole episode on the Blix curve, which I will Check link. Check out Deborah Quilter's Blix curve episode because it is relevant. Just like the heart works on a Starling curve, ideal muscle fiber lengths to pump, pump, pump. Here we've got something that's open, close, open, close, something moving, something stabilizing, always 
work from a position of function. What is the position of function? Well, it's kind of an extrapolation of the swing of the walk. So I'm walking, I'm swinging, and I'm here. So I have a somewhat vertical plane through the forearm, wrist, and hand. Now, you obviously have to be somewhat palm up to play a guitar, but a little bit less so when you go up. Recommend looking at any, any video on YouTube of the great Argentinian jazz guitarist, Oscar Aleman, A-L-E-M-A-N. He was dancing with his guitar, and there's a great touching scene in the movie where he's up like this. It's his dance partner. He's not there flat, um. perpendicular to the spine, because that forces you into wrist flexion and thereby makes you work inefficiently and with strain. So bring the neck up. Doesn't have to be to an extreme, but you know, bass players are playing here, cellists are playing here, and so on. So do a little of that so that you're totally relaxed there. The thumb is on the back of the neck of the guitar, never straining. Go to Stumac so you can get a guitar regulating set of tools inexpensively so that you can have ideal distances, low action without string buzzing. So string to fretboard, fret's relationship is perfect throughout. No buzzing, but easy. I don't like to hurt my fingertips, so I use flat wound strings that are just smooth as silk as opposed to round wound, which are bump, 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 bump. I don't like that. So as long as you've got enough tonal control, either on the guitar, the amplifier, the computer, then you can use flat wound strings instead of round wound. These let you glide, no string noise, piece of cake, low action. And then the next thing you want to do is avoid bar chords, B-A-R-R-E. They're the devil because you have sustained, you're in effect putting this nut way up towards the bridge and holding it. And that sustained hold is gonna drive your tendons against the nerve and the nerves driven against the undersurface of the roof of the carpal tunnel and more trouble can start. And so you always wanna do chords that are movable, that don't involve barring any more than you absolutely have to. And so what do you do to study it? Well, he left our world far too early, but he was the uber genius, okay? So if you look at Warren Noon's book or any books that are kind of from the people who've come after him, you'll see all of the fabulous, wonderful, finger-friendly chord boxes, all of the major, minor, augmented, diminished, sevenths, altered, sevenths, ninths, elevenths, thirteenths, six slash nine chords, everything you need in your vocabulary, then you realize that you don't have to hurt yourself while you're navigating a fretboard in any idiom of music. So study those little chord boxes because you'll find the ones that are finger friendly that don't unnecessarily repeat the, re the root of the chord. And better to think before you act, obviously as a surgeon of some experience, for me, it's economy of motion. So then once you, once you realize that, okay, it's, it's hanging very comfortably, you're not head forward, you're not reaching around like this, your hand that's going to strum has an adequate pick or if you're using fingers or thumb only, that's fine. West Montgomery was thumb only, but just a nice relaxed, like the gypsy jazzers. So just bringing out a dish rag it really is what it is. It's never any kind of precious little push down and hold and make odd independent use of the fingers. I mean, you realize that no two hands are put together the same way. For example, I've got independent flexion of my little finger on this hand. And so that works on the fretboard, but I was born and this decision is made, made in five to eight weeks of intrauterine life. I don't have my, I don't have an independent. I'm in the 15 to 20% that has no independent little finger flexor. It works somewhat with the ring but these guys work together. So I embrace and work around, adapt and improvise around anatomical variation. So for a hand surgeon or maybe anybody, just look at this book and use it as bedtime reading and understand anatomic variation is more common than anybody realizes. That includes nerves, tendons, vessels, so on, so on. So I work around things. I, I, don't, I don't pretend that I'm something, someone I'm not. So a nice, nice, relaxed little technique with the right hand, never straining, never straining it. And as we go around, we see that I'm not hyperflexing. I'm not doing unnecessary bar chords. I've, I've 
picked up the guitar the way anybody should, any instrument I learned, all of the chord forms, found them all on the fretboard, learned to name all the notes on the fretboard, and then realized that spare is good, dense is a frequency fight with the pianist or the bass player, and you don't want to double any of the, the notes that are being done. And if you're Joe Pass style of chord melody playing, then that's okay. You don't have to make very, very dense finger busting stretches. Make it tasteful, make it musical, musical. play for five minutes, self-record, listen back in real time, and then see if it was too dense for the audience so they could not follow, or whether it was just totally relaxed, makes them want to listen, but still has interest. So you've talked about carpal tunnel syndrome, Dr. Marcus, and what about things like only, I'm sure it's different for both hands. Like if you're fretting, pressing too hard when you're fretting, that would give you one injury. And then if you're doing something weird with your shoulder in the strumming hand, that could lead to other injuries. So what are the common injuries that people might experience and avoid as you've spoken through the uh, technique? Okay. Well, remarkably common are thumb problems, and it depends on age, but you see, if you're going over the top of the neck of the guitar to reach the bass strings, then you're at risk for what's called trigger thumb, where your tendon gets so tight in its little rings that it has to navigate that it can get stuck, especially in the morning, it may loosen up during the day or may not, but avoid thumb over the top because it's common to see trigger thumb among guitarists, usually after their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. But try not to go over the top for bass strings unless you've got a very narrow neck guitar. One of the reasons I made this little guitar, and I actually narrowed the neck beyond expectation, was so that I, if I had to occasionally hit a bass string with a thumb, fine. I'm not way out here and hurting myself yeah. on a big neck. neck. Neck geometry matters. Trigger thumb, also trigger fingers, especially in the barring finger. If you're holding, stopping down multiple strings, you get the same in the index or any of the other digits. And that'll be painful clicking and sometimes sticking where you have to mechanically straighten the finger. Those are trigger digits, which is a tendon entrapment. So what other tendon entrapment do I see? Well, I see de Quer vein, stenosing tenosynovitis, long name for the thumb abductor takes it away, thumb extensor straightens it, and they get caught tight in the first of six tunnels, not the carpal tunnel, six tunnels on the top of the hand, notorious, the first extensor compartment. And that's usually straining the thumb on the back of the neck of the guitar, sometimes on the right hand going too far in an extreme and pushing this wedge of muscle and tendon into this unyielding fiber and bone first extensor tunnel, de Quervain stenosing tenosynovitis. You can see tendonitis or tenosynovitis at wrist level at any of these tendons if you're working them too hard. And that will be manifest by pain, might be burning pain, could radiate out, radiate up. But if you're playing and you get some of that, you, you better take a break, listen back to what you recorded. And self, immediate self-care is a little massage with lotion or cream or CBD oil and always working from tips of thumb and fingers up towards the elbow to mechanically empty any inflammatory waste out of the affected part up to let it dump into the system. And then beyond that, we have the entrapped neuropathies. And as Deborah has elegantly explained in other videos, including this one, just a brief recap, most common carpal tunnel syndrome, numbness, tingling, thumb index, middle and half of ring finger, median nerve, median strip on highway down the middle under a fiber roof, the roof or flexor retinaculum, carpal tunnel roof. And this nerve not only gives you that feeling, but gives you action in the thumb muscle, thenar muscle, also some fine tuning of index and long finger by muscles called lumbricals. And that'll be manifest by numbness and tingling, may awaken you from sleep wee hours of the night and may persist into the day. And then exacerbated by the palm down typing position if you're doing that sort of thing. And so that's something to catch early and probably see someone who knows what they're doing to figure it out with you. And sometimes resulting in nerve conduction studies to check in my office always ultrasound, diagnostic ultrasonography to check for nerve problems. That's median nerve carpal tunnel. Ulnar nerve is half of the ring finger and all a little finger. And that's going behind the funny bone, medial epicondyle, 
that comes out here, it's, uh, it's in a safe zone, then it could get tightened at the ulnar tunnel, cubital tunnel elbow, ulnar tunnel wrist. And so again, that would be flexion, sustained bending, curling of the wrist of a guitarist, numbness, tingling, little finger, half of ring, maybe some weakness because the ulnar nerve is the nerve of dexterity. It serves 15 out of 20 small or intrinsic muscles in the hand. And so you start to get weak and sometimes fasciculating, maybe a little tremulous. And that can be a sign of cubital tunnel, which can be sensory only, meaning numbness, tingling, could be motor only, rarely, but weakness in the muscles, loss of dexterity, or more commonly both. And so that's, again, something to get looked into. The third nerve is the radial nerve. And radial nerve can be compressed in the arm. Lateral intermuscular septum can be compressed between brachialis, brachioradialis on the near side of the elbow crease, the radial tunnel. It then courses over the head of the radius bone, can be trapped famously here at a little arcade called Arcade of Froche. And that is going to serve these extensor muscles, the straightened thumb and fingers. And so they're weak, quick positioning muscles, but you can start to drop the wrist and drop the fingers with radial nerve compression. You can also have burning pain where the pain will go along here all that way. And that's the sensory branch of the radial nerve. Separately, you can have the radial sensory branch compressed down at the wrist, distal radial sensory entrapment neuropathy. So beware of that. I'm not, this isn't fear mongering. This is really about general maintenance. You can also have tenosynovitis on the palm side, thumb, fingers. So the astute medical professional looking at you is going to check thematically in two pathways of examination. One, nerves all the way from neck to fingertips, never myopically focused out on carpal tunnel only. And then the examining individual will check for any anatomically discrete inflammatory conditions. And by the way, I'm always palpating the thyroid gland checking for enlargement, meaning thyromegaly, goiter, or palpable masses, checking for cervical and supraclavicular adenopathy. I mean, I don't want to miss something could, which could frankly be horrific and life-threatening in the midst of looking at inflammatory conditions. So to become a complete physician, I'm looking at all possibilities, really brain to fingertips. So to recap, the really important thing is technique. And it sounds yes. like listening to your body, taking breaks, probably watching out if you're getting fatigued, stopping, listening to yourself and listening and learning with your ears rather than playing. So that would be a good thing. The other thing I'm really happy that you brought up and it's you can't use your other pair of hands to play the guitar or to use your computer. So I'm going to do, eventually I'm going to do a whole segment on computer technique and ulnar deviation and dorsiflexion and how you can avoid getting into problems there and also proper ergonomics. But I think dictation is better. We're going to do a segment on that Friday. So uh, thank you so much for this really enlightening look. And I hope that everybody listening goes out and makes their own guitars. Well, yeah, I want to tell you that this was actually one of twins because to use both halves of my brain. Yes, indeed, I didn't bring the other one, but the other one is a lefty guitar. So I made two, there are mirror images because I want to equally use hemispheres with their connecting corpus callosum so that I can maintain ambidexterity as one who does surgery ambidextrously and handles instruments in the OR. I want to ambidextrously handle instruments outside of the OR. Wow. <laughs> That's really something. I mean, brushing your teeth can be challenging with your left hand, but actually you inspired one of my students to start doing that. So we did a, a segment on ambidexterity that I will link to. Thank you so much for coming onto the show, Dr. Marcusin, and bringing your guitar in to show us um, how to use it properly. And I'm sure a lot of guitarists are gonna be grateful that we recorded this session. Always a joy to be with you. Thank you. See you next time.